name is Teresa Norton, and I'm going to be talking to you about engineering. So, story time, way back when I was in high school, I had no idea what engineering was. And then one day, someone told me that engineering is designing a solution to solving a problem. And I had no idea what that meant. That is so vague. <laughs> so, to find out what exactly that meant, I started looking at college degree programs. The reason why I looked at those programs is because they tell you exactly what they'll be teaching you. And something that piqued my interest was a program called Architectural Engineering. So in this program, they taught me the entire process of everything that you needed to know in order to design a building. So I took some classes in Civil Engineering, which is more than just roads and bridges. They also talk to you and teach you about how to design for what's under your feet. I took some structural engineering classes, which is how to keep a building upright and to prevent it from falling over. I took some classes in materials, so that includes your traditional building materials like concrete and steel, but it also included some materials like aluminum, which is super lightweight. I took some classes in architecture, which was really fun because that's very creative and you get to learn things like what components should be in a building and why these components need to be there and what they're going to be used for. I took my personal favorite, some MEP classes, which we'll talk about more in a bit. I also took some modeling software classes, which if you guys have any chance whatsoever to learn different programs, to try out different programs, please do. There's a bunch out there and they're all different, they're all unique, and it looks really good to have a basic understanding of a little bit of everything. Um, and then finally, I took some classes in construction, which we're all pretty much pros at because of last week. So, what do I do? Well, I work for an MEP firm. MEP stands for Mechanical, Electrical, and Plumbing Engineering. So I do mechanical on a day-to-day -day basis, which for me, let's say for an example, I'm working on a bakery project. So the first step is that I would look at what is going to be in your building, what's all included in this bakery space. Then I would do a whole bunch of calculations, like a whole bunch, guys. So that way, I could see how much air conditioning and how much heating you're going to need in your bakery space, right? Then, using all of the information I learned in school and some continuing education, because that's super important in engineering, just to stay up to date with everything, um, I would look and think of the best system, the best method of how we're going to condition and heat your bakery space. And then finally, some of that modeling software to design it, to put it into a model, to put it onto a sheet of paper that's going to show you exactly how this is going to work, how my plan is going to work out for you, how your bakery will ultimately be conditioned. So also at an MEP firm, I have some electrical engineering co-workers and they're mainly responsible for creating power and lighting plants. <clears throat> and then I work with some plumbing engineers who really wanted me to tell you guys that plumbing engineering is so much more than uh, dealing with the waste. It's also about when you turn on a faucet, how hot water gets to you almost instantaneously. So that being said, I have a couple things to tell you guys about engineering. The first is a big old dose of reality. It's hard. You guys probably already know that, but I really want to reiterate to you guys that you don't have to be a genius to be an engineer. Lord knows I'm not. But what you need to have, the most important thing that you need to be an engineer is to be a hard worker and to be unafraid to be a hard worker, all right? It's gonna take you so much work. Every single day that you're in that 
college class, every single day that you're in that professional work environment, it's going to feel like you're doing a puzzle. You're going to be working to solve a problem, and that's not easy. But if you don't give up, at the end of the day, you're going to feel so rewarded and so awesome because you did that. Hi, my name is Hollis Scheffler and I work for Pacheco Coke Engineers. We are a civil engineering firm and I focus primarily on land development. I wanted to talk to you guys about an important aspect of land development engineering, that is ponds. More often than not, ponds are required on a site where the drainage and flow leaving the site is greater than what was on the site before. These ponds are called detention ponds. Detention ponds are needed when a site increases in impervious cover. An impervious cover is anything from structures to paving that doesn't allow water to pass through. With development, we are usually increasing our impervious cover as we are taking blank canvas or tract of grassy land that has little to no buildings on it previously and then adding paving and buildings to it. You have probably noticed that the water flowing over asphalt and concrete moves much quicker than water over grass. So with a detention pond, it is required for us to detain or hold back flow for a certain period of time. The difference in this quick movement flow from the proposed site down to how the site was previously. This ideally keeps the new development from causing flooding downstream. In addition to detention measures, the City of Austin and other jurisdictions require us to provide water quality measures as we send water into our existing creeks and streams. There are a number of different ways, shapes, and forms that this can be done, but generally, the water that is flowing from a site is to pass through treatments such as sand filters, forest rock avians, long grassy swales, or a combination thereof. This helps filter out the dirt, debris, trash, and that you oftentimes see flowing into a storm drain inlet during a rain event and helps keep our creeks clean. Be on the lookout for these important ponds next time you're driving around Austin. Thanks. Hello, my name is Rick Pritchoff and I'm a civil engineer. I've been asked to tell you a little bit about what it's like to be in water resources. One of the principal areas a water resources engineer works in is hydrologic studies. The purpose of a study is to take a rainfall and estimate how much water runs off from that event. Here are a couple of example areas that I've worked in, one in the Rio Grande Valley and another out in West Texas. During my 17 years at the Lower Colorado River Authority, I got involved in a number of flood operations. My job was to estimate inflows into the Highland Lakes and then determine what kind of floodgate operations were required to safely pass the event. Here's an example of what one of those gate operations looks like at Wirtz Dam. One of my primary duties while with the LCRA was inspecting the dams. The purpose of a dam inspection is to identify potential issues and address them before they become problems. Over my career, I've been fortunate enough to inspect dams in California, Texas, Louisiana, and in Georgia. By law, dams are required to pass designed flood events and remain stable or in place throughout the entire storm. During my time with LCRA, I was involved with anchor projects at Wirtz Dam and at Inks Dam. Another aspect of water resources engineering involves improving operations. We added 10 foot gates, similar to what you see in this photo, to a dam down in Bay City, Texas. And the sole purpose was to increase pumping efficiency for an irrigation pump plant that we operated in the lower Colorado River Basin. Sometimes we're called on to rehabilitate distressed dams. Here's one that we worked on in Tyler, Texas, which is actually a sediment pond for Lake Bellwood. 
One of my favorite projects over my career was getting to design a brand new dam in East Texas. Nothing like working on a multi-million dollar dam. Another area that a water resources engineer works in is design of hydraulic structures. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, the left is a weir that we designed specifically for flow measurement and the right's just an example culvert for a roadway crossing. Yet another area that a water resources engineer works in is erosion control. Here are a couple of photos from a project I had in Oklahoma where we were called on to first evaluate the existing erosion protection and then determine and design a new protection scheme for the facility. Sometimes you're just flat lucky on projects that you get to work on. This is a stream restoration that I worked on in Idaho. We got to visit the site. It was a phosphate mine that had completed its operation and they wanted to return a stream that had been sacrificed during the mining operations and return it back to its natural state. Another interesting area that I've been able to work in is litigation. I've been called on as an expert witness in a, a number of different litigation cases. It can be stressful, but it sure is a lot of fun. The last area I'm going to mention is my opportunity to teach. I get to teach TechStock classes on basic hydrology and hydraulics and in culvert design. It's very rewarding to be able to work with young engineers and help them get a foundation established for their future work. I hope you found this interesting and I especially hope that you now realize that water resources engineering is not as boring as you might have thought.